Brenda Zolich uh, recorded her prese presentation for us, and we're going to be taking that in. But just I want to introduce Brenda to you. Um, Brenda is Senior Policy Analyst at the National Association of Wetland Managers. Brenda designs and conducts research and policy analysis on wetlands and other aquatic resource issues, analyzes federal policy changes, manages projects, designs trainings for wetland professionals, coordinates webinars, and makes presentations on the organization's work to various audiences. She has led major multi-year projects for the organization, including projects on Clean Water Act implementation, pipeline permitting, integrated wetland management, and for the last several years, beaver-related restoration. Brenda earned her PhD in public policy from the University of Southern Maine, focusing on water policy and collaborative environmental management. She has more than 25 years of organizational leadership experience and a strong background in academic and action research, facilita facilitation, training, and communications. Hi, my name is Brenda Zalich. I am Senior Policy Analyst for the National Association of Wetland Managers, and I am thrilled to be uh, participating today, unfortunately not in person due to COVID restrictions for my work, but um, I am here to talk to you about beaver-related restoration and this fantastic project that we were able to work on with the Bureau of Land Management, uh, which created a national dialogue on beaver. And it's our hope today uh, that we share with you enough information that you choose to be part of that national dialogue over time. Um, and we're inviting you uh, to join with us and uh, the Beaver Institute uh, to move forward with a national work group as well. So our presentation today, and I have a picture of myself, I wouldn't normally put that up, but I was hoping to be there in person with you. So here I am. Uh, I look much better in this picture than I do in person. So uh, I'm, I'm in a way, it's a good thing. Um, but I certainly would love to be interacting with you, getting to know your interests, your issues uh, that you would like to see addressed, how we could move things forward and just develop great working relationships. And I hope to be able to do so in the future. Um, so I'm going to share with you today a little bit about the National Association of Wetland Managers, who we are, so that you understand the context within which we are working, um, how we got involved in uh, beaver-related restoration work, uh, the approach we took to gathering information because we did capture a lot and, and plan to continue to do so. I'm going to talk about how we hosted a national dialogue um, and the data that we collected from that, um, how that was used to create some tools and training resources, um, and then what we're planning to do next and how we hope that you will join us. Uh, so we are going to share with you an invitation to share and participate in our next efforts. So who are we? NOM, which is formerly known as the Association of State Wetland Managers. So I bet that you have heard of ASWM. A lot of you have. Uh, we run a ton of webinars. Uh, we run between 20 and 40 webinars a year. Um, and we work in all sorts of areas with many different partners and agencies. Um, so if you haven't heard of us, check us out, nawm.org. Uh, we recently changed our name uh, back in January of this year. Uh, the the ASWM name was well recognized and acknowledged and respected, but we felt that the Association of State Wetland Managers didn't necessarily reflect the wide variety of organizations and agencies that we work with. And most importantly, it didn't reflect that we have strong partnerships with tribes and are actively working with tribes. So we changed our name to the National Association of Wetland Managers, uh, which includes states, tribes, federal agencies, nonprofits, academia, businesses, and so forth. So we have a lot of stuff that uh, that we do with all sorts of different stakeholders. Um, so we are a national 501c3 association established in 1983. Uh, we were established to provide a forum for communication, problem solving, and capacity building. Uh, we have been working with states, tribes, federal agencies, and other partners uh, on a wide variety of wetland and aquatic resource issues over 35 years. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out is our name is about wetlands, and that is our primary focus, but we certainly look at rivers, streams, lakes, and uh, other related uh, issues, and certainly a focus on water quality uh, and restoration. Uh, 50 states, 55 tribes, and 10 EPA regions currently participate in ongoing NOM projects, as well as local governments, academics, and other federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and many members from the business sector. We have lots and lots of consultants that uh, work with us. 
States and tribes, including our 1,300 members, look at NOM for leadership in matters of national wetland policy, wetland program development, applying sound science, interpreting and implementing the Clean Water Act and related programs, and restoring aquatic systems. Our various email lists reach over 18,000 individuals. If you're not on those lists, you, uh, we welcome you to join us. NOM is the only organization nationally that focuses exclusively on building state and tribal wetland program capacity with and for state and tribal program staff. So uh, that is our primary focus. So whenever we build a project or uh, run a webinar and people say, who's your target audience? Uh, state and tribal wetland program staff are always number one with others uh, as well. Our focus is on providing accurate, useful, and timely information. Uh, we're committed to diversifying the wetland workforce and have spearheaded an initiative with the Society of Wetland Scientists to mentor the next generation of wetland professionals, focusing on building diversity in the workforce and adapting training and workforce development activities to encourage multicultural participation and leadership. Our greatest strength is our ability to develop and facilitate national expert work groups, which that you pay attention to that because we are going to be talking to you about that in a minute that bring a level of expertise to NOMS projects that has been critical to our success over the years. Uh, we currently have a staff of nine who collectively possess skills and experience to carry out all the programmatic, administrative, financial, stakeholder engagement, facilitation, and communication work that we do. And this list here that you see on the screen, um, the things that we are sort of known for providing is access to peer networks and peer-to-peer -peer sharing. We always are collecting best practices, models, templates, if you have a problem that has to do with uh, wetlands and water resources, give us a call. Uh, we will usually be able to connect you with somebody. We have a vast network of, of partners. Uh, we provide a lot of web-based resources. We have our own products, and then we also connect people to other relevant uh, resources. We don't ever like to recreate the wheel. Um, we run informational and training webinars, and we have lots of archive recordings. Our archive is massive now, um, and so when you have that at the time of need uh, training question or want to uh, learn something, check out our archive. Uh, we'll be able to do that. And we also run live, especially sort of current issue kind of webinars. We have online training modules with optional knowledge quizzes and certificates, so you can get continuing education units for the work that you do with us. We do policy analyses. We do lots of comment letters on emerging federal regulation. We all are known sort of for insights and unpacking of emerging rulemaking. So obviously, uh, Waters of the U.S. rule has been a big thing for us. The just hot off the press, shall we say, with the 401 uh, certification rule. Uh, that's there. We're tracking 404G. We look at treatment as a state. We look at nationwide permits. So all of those things that are kind of confounding uh, as far as what should I think here? These are massive decisions. Uh, we can provide you some guidance on that. And we are about to unroll a policy tracker. Um, national work groups on existing and emerging needs uh, based issues, in-person conferences and trainings, capacity building resources, all sorts of those, and then collaboration, which I just mentioned. So that as the backdrop of we take on complex, difficult policy, administrative, regulatory management issues. We bring together experts around the country. We start thinking through what are, what are the biggest challenges here? What are the needs? How do we start unpacking that issue? How do we bring to the fore resources that already exist that we can use to help support this work? And then how do we bring out specific outputs that people need? How do we create models? How do we uh, develop templates? How do we share best practices? How do we get people to come together to agreement on uh, an approach? How do we share case studies? Things like that. And um, we knew that there were major issues around uh, the storage of water in the West. Um, and we were doing a lot of work in other places of the country, but we wanted to support Western states. So nature-based solutions um, are obviously something we're extremely interested in. Um, and um, so beaver restoration was one of those areas that we were really hearing a lot about. Um, and uh, so beaver-related restoration came into our focus. And we just sort of sent out this idea to a lot of folks that we knew and said, hey, are you interested in beaver-related restoration? Uh, is this a topic that folks care about? What's the state of practice? And we had this huge response. 
uh, we had tons and tons of people. We had about 60 people immediately reply to us saying that uh, they were very interested in this topic. This was something that everybody wants more resources put towards. So we had numerous meetings and calls, and this is about five years ago now. And we worked with EPA, NRCS, BLM, and so forth. And four years of concept building led to finally a partnership with BLM uh, through a grant that we were able to secure, and then a second grant that we were able to, to secure to do projects to support BRR. Um, and we hosted a six part webinar series. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of the people who joined with us to make presentations. You're gonna wanna check it out. Um, and then we also hosted this thing called a national dialogue. Um, and the national dialogue I'll show you in just a second. Um, and then out of that, we created this BRR online resource. And that's what we want to continue to, uh, to maximize, we want to add resources to it, we want to strengthen it, we want it to be a go-to sort of clearinghouse for BRR information. And we know that some other places have those as well, but they tend to be more regional or very specific to a certain kind of practice or whatever. So we at NOM sort of want to be the one uh, to, well, we don't need to be the one, we would like to have a resource that people find is useful. And if there's ever a time that it needs to go somewhere else or live somewhere else other than us, uh, we are all, we are not about holding on to things. We are about making change happen and then uh, handing that where it needs to be. So just so that you know, um, that I want to make sure that you don't think that NOM is trying to control uh, where information goes. But at the moment, we are a, a useful place. We have great web resources. We have a staff that's uh, really good at delivering online training and online webinars. Um, and we also uh, have this national dialogue tool. And then we also um, have training modules, which I'm gonna show. So then let's just talk for a second about the, uh, the national dialogue. So what is this thing that I'm uh, chatting about extensively? So we wanted to be able to capture information. We wanted it to be incredibly simple. We wanted it to be uh, useful. Uh, we wanted people to be able to come in and out of the resource as they gathered a piece of information. So it's definitely not a survey. It's a Google form that allows invited people to enter information into this form. Uh, we ask very broad uh, requests for information. So we're not asking the specific questions like you would in a survey. You're not and uh, making selections, what you're doing is uh, sort of unloading ideas. So uh, Beaver Restoration Professionals were asked to participate in the national dialogue by providing input to this Google form designed to collect information around relevant Beaver-related restoration themes. Participation was entirely voluntary, and you'll see that it was indeed, um, because we, we put it out to a large number of people, and uh, we're looking to build that now. Participants were act to, asked to share their experiences with beaver restoration related uh, barriers and opportunities, as well as their ideas, questions, and suggestions for ways to improve those restoration processes and outcomes in that restoration community. ASWM at the time, which is now NOM, and BLM jointly compiled a list of 125 professionals that uh, we used snowball sampling. Contact. Who should we contact here? Who should we contact there? Uh, so we used that to collect a list of 125 professionals identified as working actively on beaver-related restoration activities or planning and invited them to participate. The national dialogue process was able to collect information from 34 of these professionals. So I want to point out that we have this fantastic tool that, need you, that needs you. You need to start giving us information into this tool. Uh, but what we captured from these 34 people, you would think, you know, oh, 34, if you just had a regular survey, that wouldn't be very much. But the 34 people who participated in this national dog were, dialogue were magnificent. Um, they added all sorts of fantastic information. So of that, um, we were able to identify roles that they worked in. So uh, we allowed people to indicate more than one role. So 74% um, were project managers for beaver-related restoration work. 50% of them um, were providers of technical guidance for these projects. 12% funded those projects. 8% conducted research on the work. 6% were landowners where the work was taking place. And 6% are permit reviewers for applications to conduct beaver-related restoration projects. 
participants provided information from their work from 15 states, and you can see where those states were. I find it quite interesting because as I was talking to um, to Michael and Adam from the Beaver Institute, their map for this conference looks a little bit similar to this. Uh, a few more New England, a few more middle uh, mid-Atlantic, but um, areas that are missing in our group are also missing here. So we really want, if you are not from one of the states that's missing here, we would really like if you know somebody who is from one of those states to let us know. And you're going to get my contact information and uh, Michael's going to be talking about how we um, can capture information um, with a link after the fact. So states that we had included Alaska, California, Colorado, Idaho, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Montana, New Mexico, Oregon, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, Utah, Washington State, Wisconsin, and West Virginia, with the largest number of participants from Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, and the Kickapoo Tribe also provided input. We were very grateful for that. So that's another area that we really want to, uh, to add information from tribes as well. So what is this national dialogue? Um, we wanted to have something that was more than a survey. We wanted to have it be an iterative process. So at NOM, we created this system where we would have a work group that identified key topic or issues that we wanted to gather. Um, a sub work group would work on a specific element of it where we would brainstorm a list of questions about a key topic. And then using the Google form process, uh, NOM would uh, solicit additional questions and needs requests on the topic. Um, and you know, we would ask them, are there any models? Are there any great resources we should look at? Who should we be talking to? This national dialogue element allows us to collect information from people who weren't part of the work group, from people who might only have one thing they wanted to contribute. You, so they don't have to complete the whole form. It's just they add this one thing. Uh, maybe it's somebody who wants to be engaged on a regular basis, but again, can't be part of the work group. So they make multiple entries. So I'll show you that. So content requests, once we have that information, we're then integrated into work group list of questions and provide to presenters and the work group so that we could then use those in our project planning. Uh, we could use it in uh, the content we wanted for webinars. So we were able to ask our speakers to address certain things and then also making sure that as we create online training modules that those uh, things that people need the most are incorporated. So. It's an iterative process, and what, this was not done once. This is done over and over again. So we collected this great set of knowledge, which I'm going to be sharing you some of those with, with you some of those findings. But what's still missing? So we need more people. I mean, 34, fantastic. Those 34 people are fantastic people, and they gave us great information. But obviously, we want more. There's all sorts of you here at this conference today. Uh, BeaverCon, we want you behind us in uh, providing information into here. One of the things is we we want breadth, so we want to we want to capture things that we haven't caught already. But we also want to understand commonality. So if we see more and more people answering with the same resource or the same problem or uh, they're using the same model, that provides us with really great information as well. Um, but we are not restricting people to, uh, as I said, like a survey where they have to click off on specific things because we want to know from your broadest set of experiences, what are you, what are you seeing and what are you using? So we want more diversity in the BRR experience. Uh, we want to fill in the gaps. Uh, we know that the Mid-Atlantic, there's a lot more work going on than shows in our data. Uh, the Southeast, we think there's more work going on as well. We think there's some work going on in the Gulf Coast. We don't think that there's a lot of work going on around the Mississippi border. So um, we're, if there is, we should know about it. Um, and we definitely want more tribes to participate because we feel that uh, this nature-based solution is uh, deeply connected uh, to tribal practice. And uh, we want to make sure that that's reflected here as well. So what did we discover with the National Dialogue? We asked them, why people undertake BRR work. And I'm not gonna go over that because you're not, you're here because you are believers in the beavers. Um, and so we have all sorts of information in our report that talks about what, what is the justification? What are the water quality benefits, climate change benefits, um, the, the 
aesthetics, the hydrology, all of that. So I'm not going to cover that today because you are already uh, on that uh, on that same playing space. Um, common challenges associated with the practice of BRR, uh, training and guidance on uh, BRR techniques. We wanted to capture some good examples of BRR. So what do you think uh, would be, if you wanted to explain this to other folks, what are some great examples we could point them to? Modeling and placement uh, are always issues with BRR, but you already know that. And planning, planning and permitting low-tech process-based restoration projects, we know that there are, there are some practices out there that uh, are helpful as sort of general guidance, but that um, every situation is incredibly unique. And then we also captured lessons learned. So um, we have under, under legal and regulatory challenges, permitting issues rose right to the top as well as legal and water rights. So permitting issues, lots of folks do not feel comfortable with the concept of beaver related restoration. What is it going to do to the landscape? It's not clear inputs and outputs. It doesn't fit well into the kinds of projects that permit uh, that, that, admin, that regulators are used to approving. So lots of uh, issues around how to craft beaver related restoration. Now, the, I think the most challenging is when you move beaver onto the landscape where they were not uh, right before your project. Uh, but even BDAs um, and a restoration to improve vegetation with the goal of bringing beavers back can be quite controversial. So how do we address that? How do we provide um, examples and templates of how to change permitting processes or, or documents that would make it possible. Legal and water rights, um, as we know in the arid west, water rights are a really big issue. Um, having Not only having the science, which we know is essential for making that case, we need the science, but we also need uh, to look at how are things crafted in a way that will make it possible for us to, to accomplish this. Administrative barriers, uh, just all sorts of challenges around uh, the, the use of specific materials, uh, the, the paperwork not really accommodating the use of BRR and so forth. And then mitigation crediting, both in the sense that uh, could you get credit uh, for mitigation using uh, beaver related restoration? Or um, is our beaver is beaver related restoration possibly going to impact a mitigation project in a way that's unreliable? So um, we have those challenges. And then another thing that we found was, uh, which I'm sure that this unpacking of the the <laughs> the wrong information about beavers. There is cultural resistance to restoration work involving beaver. There's the belief that rivers and streams ought to be simple static channels that perfectly balance water and sediment flow. There's the perception that beaver are problematic and not useful. They might, people think that they're not historically part of the region or watershed or that they're plenty already in place. Uh, misunderstandings that are really common are belief that beaver were not historically in the watershed, that beaver restoration uh, doesn't require something else. They don't realize that they need hardwood trees. Um, People not understanding what a, quote, fully beavered landscape looks like, uh, belief that beaver will make flooding worse, um, the, just a total lack of understanding of the relationship between beavers and the hydrology of watersheds, and also restoring beaver-created uh, wetlands can significantly reduce peak flows. People do not understand um, how the water flows across the land and in, uh, in the ground, and so not knowing that, they don't understand the role that beaver can play. Other challenges that we found were that, of course, beaver-related restoration is not a panacea. It is incredibly important to place it in the right place uh, to construct the proper uh, or, or a useful approach. Um, we've seen one of the biggest concerns is that um, there, there are human-beaver interactions that are very problematic. You want to keep them away from uh, major infrastructure, highways, things like that. So there are tools out there. Most of you are probably familiar with BRAT and others uh, that help you figure out where to place it. So what we found was that if people don't know that um, and don't use those, it's very hard to be able to place them in the right place. There are concerns about impacts on birds and wildlife, other beaver management issues around trapping and conflicting management goals, lack of access to data for decision making. So it, you might have a great model, but if you don't have access, if you don't have the data that you need uh, to put that in, uh, then you it's, it's very difficult. 
a lack of resources to support this work, and then lower priority of BRR compared to other competing projects that are much more common and, and uh, accepted. And then a lack of trained professionals uh, to conduct beaver-related restoration projects. I bet a lot of the ones that are fantastic are right here listening to this presentation. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that uh, you are supported, but we also want to see whether or not we can get more people, um, especially in not, not in concentrated areas, but across the country that are able to do this work. So we're interested in making sure that the best restoration handbooks and guides get into the hands of those folks that are, uh, that are learning about this process, that we are able to provide ongoing training webinars and online modules that are able to support that training as well. And then also that we connect people to the literature that they need that are specific to their uh, areas. And uh, Utah State University has one of the best BRR literature compilations uh, out there, uh, but we provide a link to that. We're not going to do that whole process again, but we're also going to highlight which ones people are using the most. So as a result of the work that we collected in this dialogue, we created a non-BLM beaver related restoration training series. Um, and uh, we had a whole series of webinars, the history of beaver and ecosystem service and the ecosystem services they provide, identifying where to place beavers and when to use beaver mimicry for low tech to uh, restoration in the arid west, case studies of long term changes from beaver restoration activities, addressing common barriers and objections to beaver restoration work, coalition building for beaver based stream and wetland restoration success and beaver restoration for climate resiliency. We also, outside of this series, also uh, back in 2017, we have a recording uh, with uh, Jeremy Maestas and uh, Joe Wheaton talking about partnering with beaver to benefit sage grouse on working land. So uh, obviously sage grouse in the arid west uh, is a huge reason for uh, doing that. Um, and we also did um, another webinar recently um, talking about climate change and fire hazards and the role of beaver in that. So. I could talk to you all I want about what the topics are, but the real reason that you should go look at them is what you see over here on the left. We had a fantastic set of trainers and presenters that were with us. So Kent Sorensen from Utah's Division of Wildlife Resources, Amy Chadwick from Great West Engineering, who works in Colorado, Joe Wheaton, Utah State University, Ellen Bull, fantastic from Colorado State University, Nick Bowles, Wally McFarland, uh, these folks uh, working with Utah State University and, and Joe Wheaton, uh, just top notch. Justin Jimenez from Bureau of Land Management, Chris Jordan from NOAA, Alexa Whipple from the Methow Beaver Project, talk about a project that you want to look at. And then Natalie Arroyo from Eureka City. Um, she, she's a council person, but many, many other things uh, and was able to give some very specific insights. And then Emily Fairfax, as I said, she, uh, she did a webinar um, in this webinar series, but then she just recently gave us an update on uh, the use of beaver to limit the impact of mega fires um, and uh, the really fantastic data that she's coming up with. So I'm sure that many of these names on the left are familiar to you, and I would encourage you to check out this. Um, and then we have Beaver Restoration for Climate Resiliency as a module here. You can see we have the presenter, the abstract, the learning objectives, and then there's a quiz. And at the end of the quiz, if you pass the quiz, you are able to get some uh, certificate of completion, which allows you to get CEUs. Uh, we also know that there's, there's a need for evidence um, for, from case studies. Um, and I'm just going to turn my timer off here. Um, that so there's the social and legal context, not just scientific, and you need to understand how to be effective at that one specific site. However, case studies still provide information that you can take from it. And it also allows you to see how the decision-making process happened. They're a tool for seeing how decisions are made and with what outcomes. And you also learn to measure, track, and communicate impacts. Also, we're really focusing in on communications and messaging uh, that are useful. Uh, often it's and communication is often where things come apart. We have this fantastic beaver resource with examples of BRR training and guidance, placement modeling planning, uh, common challenges, and a link to the National Dialogue Summary Report. So I, as I wrap up my presentation here, I come to you with um, 
a strong invitation. Please, please, please. I, ca I can't be there to, to try to sweet talk you into uh, participating here. But this national dialogue, you're going to receive an email at the end of today, and it's going to give you a link. And you can enter as many times as you want. You can answer only the elements you want to. You can make multiple entries. And this is key because as time allows, you might want to write something today. But after the initial entry, you can do follow-up content. You might want to add a reference. You might say, oh, you know what? I found this great article. I want you to put it in. So it allows, and we can connect uh, those. We can put everything that's attributed to you um, in one little file. So we can track by respondent's name. Uh, we can sort by time. So we're going to be analyzing all the uh, entries that happen right after BeaverCon, and we're going to make a new report from that. Uh, we can analyze how entries have changed between time periods. We're not really doing you know, longitudinal data analysis here, but we can see at one point in time in the national dialogue, things were one way, and then something changed. What may, we're really looking to see, like when we create this national work group, um, does that, the ongoing dialogue, does the connection that happens between people, is that going to change the way people are responding to the national dialogue? And then um, we are going to update the web resource and other offerings that we have. I know that the, the, uh, the Beaver Institute will also be using what we gather. Hopefully all of you will be using it. And then it will, we'll use that information to guide uh, what we move forward with in terms of webinars, learning modules, and so forth. And as this national work group takes place, um, it's going to inform the work of that work group, just as I met, showed you that initial model. I want to invite you quickly as my last, uh, my last comment here to our annual state tribal federal coordination meeting. It's taking place at the NCTC or the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, uh, August 15th to 19th. Um, uh, Mike is from, from the Beaver Institute, will be making a presentation on beaver related restoration. But if you are looking to connect with wetland folks and learn some new things and learn how the regulations at the national, at the federal level are impacting states and tribes, um, this would be a great place to come. So we would love to see you there. Um, the NCTC is a fantastic location um, and uh, it'll be great to see you there. So I'm going to wrap up now. Again, my name is Brenda Zolich, and I'm with the National Association of Wetland Managers. My email is very simple, brenda at nom.org. Um, and uh, check out our site. We'd love to have you be a member and be able to track everything that goes on. We're a very affordable membership, fortunately. Um, and this, we're going to be moving into a panel um, to talk about the ways that we can form this national group. Um, and so I wish that I was at the table to participate in that panel, but I know you are in great hands uh, with Mike and Adam, um, able to think about how do we work together moving forward and how do we take the energy and the knowledge and the learning that you have taken at BeaverCon and move that into a project. So I will have an opportunity to work with you through that national work group, um, and I can't wait to see you face to face, whether it's online or in person in the future. I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you today, and I, I can't wait for our work together. Thank you, Brenda, from afar. <laughs>